Majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the Son of man, that you would take care of him with honor and glory. You crown him and give him dominion over the works of your hands. What is man that you be mindful of him? Son of man, that you would take care of him with honor and glory. You crown him and give him dominion over the works of your hands.
May we hear today words of inspiration, of hope, and of encouragement. In our Lord's name, amen. Consulting your bulletin, you hear, you see our call to worship, which is responsive. It's inspired by Isaiah 55 and Psalm 63. P is for pastor, C is for congregation. Here we go, our call to worship. Only the hungry search for bread, only the thirsty look for water. Only those who ache for meaning will pursue it. Only those who yearn for a deeper life will seek it. So let us come here today with our hunger and thirst, our unsatisfied longings, our heartfelt yearnings. Amen. Come, let us sing our first hymn together. Come, the fount of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy, never ceasing, all for songs of Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Come on up, everyone. Morning, Corey. Getting there.
want you to listen to Matthew 21, verses 16. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise? Well, did you know that I'm a teacher? And it is summer vacation, isn't it? Hmm. So in the summer, I get to take a break, just like you. And that means I have no planning. I don't have to plan all my lessons. I have a plan. You have a plan? Well, good, because you know what? I'm going to take a break today, and you're going to teach. Did you know that? Yeah. And we're going to move. You're going to move? How cool. So today, you're going to teach us. My mom. Wow, oh, packing's a lot of planning, huh? Well, I'm going to tell you something, and then I'm going to count down from 10. So I'm going to give you the signal. I'm going to count down, and when I get down to zero, you're going to share your answers. So we're going to have some think time. So when I'm counting down, we're going to have our lips closed, and we're going to be thinking in our brain about what we're going to say next, okay? So. I want you to tell me something you want to do more of, okay? So it could be something like get more ice cream. It could be um, more time with your friends. So, all right, ready? Everyone's going to think. I'm going to count down from 10. What do you want to do more of? Does anyone have something they want to do more of? What do you want to do more of? Counting. Oh, sorry, say that one more time. One, you want to come to church more? Awesome. Corey, what did you say? I said, we're going to do, we have a lot of packing to do today. So you're going to do more packing? Yeah. Do you want to pack? No. My oh. Family are, we have a big, giant school. Yeah. So. What would be something you'd want to do more of? Um, do you want to play more? Do you want to read I, more? I would want to go to bed a lot. <gasps> you want to go to bed. You want to sleep more. Oh, me too. All right. Brandon, what do you think? Uh, get more ice cream. Get more ice cream. Kate? Uh, play more hockey in the summer. Oh, more hockey in the summer because we can't get enough hockey. <gasps> what about you? What do you think? More wheels on the bus. I think that's a great answer. All right. Now we're going to flip this, flip it like a pancake, and we're going to, I want you to tell me something you want to do less of. Okay? So remember, I'm going to count down, and then at the end, we'll share. Someone went less of in their life. Chores. Chores. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Chores. Chores. I knew Kate was going to say that. I know. Basketball. Less basketball? Yep. You don't want to play basketball? Yes, I do. Oh, you do? I, I want to get more sports. Well, I like you that, play but more sports. I love basketball. What's something you want to do less of? Think, Patrick. You want to do less of anything? Maybe less crying. Sometimes we get upset, right? Maybe less crying. Yeah. Maybe less. Maybe less time out. <gasps> Sometimes that happens, right? Or I don't know. Less. You might have. Thank you. Less chores. That's a good one. I like that one. All right, now, here's your next question. What's your favorite thing about church? What's your favorite thing about church? Say that again. 
community service. You like when we do things with, for people? That's awesome. Anyone else? What's your favorite thing about church? Songs. Oh, yep, yep. Those are great. We're very lucky. Corey, what's your favorite thing about church? Um, the nursery. One more. The nursery. The nursery. Oh, it's so much fun in there. Brayden, what's your favorite thing? Sunday school. Sunday school. Oh, that's going to start in about a month. Pastor Bill says he likes the sermons. I don't know if anyone heard that. <laughs> I bet so. Does he have a favorite part? Maybe the whole thing. Maybe you can't pick a favorite. All right, here's your next question. What do you, when you think of Jesus, what are some words that come to mind? So I'm going to give you a sentence starter. Jesus is... Jesus is thoughtful. Jesus is kind. Jesus is. Let me think. Caring and smart. Caring and smart. Yes. Jesus is. He's good. Oh, Jesus is good. That is what a wonderful answer. All right, last thing. What's one thing you think everyone should do that would help others? Corey, what do you think? What could someone do to help someone? Um, Better. Yeah. By doing what? By um, hugging them. Hugging them. I love that. Anyone else have an answer? Patrick, what's yours? Hmm? Get fist bumped. <laughs> That's awesome. Everyone loves a good fist bump. Um, donating stuff. Donating things. I have one. What? Giving high fives. What's something you could do to help someone? What does someone do to help you sometimes? Do they say something nice maybe? Or smile? Not sure? All right, so you can think about that. Well, I wanted you to teach us today because you know what? God loves you and Jesus wanted all the children to come and even though we have Sunday school coming up, do you know that you teach us just as much as we teach you? And so I want you to think about that, that you are teaching other people all the time. And so Jesus wants your help to be an example, just like he is. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for bringing all these children into our lives. Please help us to take a moment to thank them, to listen to them, to get joy from just being around them. And please help our children to know that they are valued, that they are loved, and that we want to hear what they have to say. In your name we pray. Amen. Beth, I think your vacation is about to come to an end in about, what, a week or two? Yeah, Get back into the classroom. <clears throat> you 
we now have the opportunity to come to our Lord and to confess to our Lord individually and as a group those thoughts and behaviors and those words that we know aren't helpful to the building up of the kingdom <coughs> in which we can pray together and in asking God's forgiveness, helping us to change our ways and our attitudes. <coughs> One of the most discouraging things for me, and I think probably for all of us when we stop to think about it, is when we uh, talk about, as Christians, uh, caring. Caring, this is something that we want to do, care for other people. And well said best, asking the kids, how do we show caring? And we all nod our head, yes, yes, yes. And then we see others in our group intentionally not caring when there was a need. And uh, that can be very upsetting and very sad, certainly for clergy when this is what we read scripture about and preach about and year after year after year after year. And then we see uh, other clergy as well as lay people ignoring that for whatever reason they have. That's sad, but I know it happens. So when we come to this prayer of confession, let us speak with our sincerity that we truly want to change. And that takes introspection. You must look into your heart of hearts. Okay? So together let us speak to our Lord. Together. Let us pray. Jesus cleanser of souls, look deep within our hearts and in our lives and clear away all that holds us back. May our minds and spirits and bodies be open to your presence and may our words and our actions be transparent to your love and truth. We pray that the church community will be nourished with new life in the vision and mission so that we do in and from here may reveal you to others. In a moment of silence, we sit before you and name those for which we seek your cleansing and healing so that we might be more faithful disciples. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Amen. Dear friends in the Lord, rejoice. For the sincere heart receives God's grace and God's mercy. He says to us that our sins are forgiven us, not because we love him so much, but that he cannot stop loving us. So as far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. Praise be to God for this good news for each one of us. Let us stand now and thank God for this good news for the Gloria. Glory be to the Father. love our Lord, our God, with all our heart, with all our mind, with our complete being. This is the first and the greatest of all the commandments, and the second is like unto it, 
that we love our neighbor, whoever that neighbor may be, as much as we love ourselves. For on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets, everything. I'm remembering an individual who wondered how God could love him. He was caught in an addiction, and as much as he tried to overcome this addiction, he failed time and time again. And he says, how can God love me who continues to sin against body, against spirit, against other people? And the response to that is this. If you pray to God, speak to God with sincerity of heart that you want to overcome this and you are seeking diligently to overcome it, even though you repeat it again and again because it seems to be beyond your efforts to stop it, God is gracious and kind. God does forgive you. So never give up trying. Never give up asking God for encouragement and strength. Keep pursuing the way, the truth, and the light of God. Today's readings will be done in conjunction with the message. Today's message will begin around uh, in Joshua. You all remember Joshua in the Old Testament? Or Joshua. Joshua? Joshua was an assistant to Moses very capable assistant to Moses. And there came a time when the people of Israel who were being led out of captivity, is, uh, Egypt, where they were, as they were coming to the Jordan River, Moses died. And God told Joshua that he was to lead the nation Israel into the new land. And Joshua felt very ill-equipped to do such a thing. How could he step into the shoes of Moses, the great man from God who brought the nation out of Egypt, captivity, to this new land, to the this man who brought down from the mountain the Ten Commandments to this person that spoke actually with God. How could he lead this nation into the new land? He did not feel equipped at all. <laughs> Sometimes that speaks for, I would believe, many of us here. There are times in our lives that we do not feel confident in ourselves to do different things, different challenges, either at work or in relationships. But it tells us in the book of Joshua, in the book of Joshua, it tells us God said to Joshua this, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. That's Joshua chapter 1 verse 9. And then he goes on later to say, God reminded him of the sufficiency of his word. That his word was all that Joshua needed to believe this word 
to live on this word and act upon this word. He says, do not let this book of law, the Bible, or Old Testament, depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. Then you will be prosperous and successful. And so, there he was, Joshua, with the Israelites, the whole ten tribes of Israel, right at the Jordan River. And he was being encouraged, take heart, be strong, cross it. Now I read from Joshua. Be strong and courageous. And they crossed the Jordan River. And here's what happened. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests stood, and to carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you are to stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulders, according to the number of the tribes of Israel, to serve as a sign among you. For in the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan River was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever and ever and ever. So, you have, you have the 12 tribes of Israel and Joshua standing before the Jordan River, Joshua being unsure of himself, God reminding him that he was with Moses, he's going to be with you. And he says, take the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was the, the symbol of God's presence with them. Place it out in front of the 12 men and all the Israelites and cross the Jordan because I shall stop the flow of the Jordan River, which appears to have happened. And they crossed over. And then he says, these 12, they were priests, Go back and pick up 12 large stones, bring them over to our camp, place them in a memorial pyramid, perhaps, so that they will always be a reminder of God's love, God's faithfulness, God's compassion, God's presence in helping, in helping. That God is with us. And by extension, it shows to those who ask the question, what are these stones? Our faithfulness to God. Our dedication to God. Our reverence for God. The memorial. To be an inspiration and an encouragement to the people of Israel. Where are the monuments today. Where would you say are the monuments today? Where do we find them? Monuments that bear witness to what God has done. Monuments that bear witness to what God is doing. Monuments that bear witness to a people of faith 
and what they are doing. Where are such monuments today, one can ask? Well, I would say they are right here. Yes, we have the monument, if you will, of the church, the structure. And when our children ask, as they will, at some point, in many different ways, what's the purpose of this building, this church, this community? What is this for? And then we can bear witness to the truth that this church building symbolizes our love for God, our respect for what God is doing to us and within us, this monument shows that we care for each other. We want to support each other, nurture each other, embrace each other. We want to be a family, not talking about each other, talking down to each other, but arm in arm, hand in hand, helping each other in this difficult thing we call living this life. We are a church, a beacon. We hold out to the world the message of hope, of renewal, of reconciliation. It's a witness. We have the communion that we are about to celebrate shortly as a memorial, a monument that so clearly tells us of God's unrelenting love, that nothing can separate us from the love of God. The teachings of Jesus Christ lead us into a union with God. As God told Joshua to not depart from the law, Ten Commandments. Meditate upon them. I mean, think about them. Think about them. How do they relate to you? Do not vary from these Ten Commandments. Live them and invite others to live them with you. We get that in our Lord's Supper. The bread of life, the teachings of God through Jesus Christ. You want to know what God is like? You look at Jesus Christ and what he said. There you find God. And because we are less than perfect, prone to err, as we sang in our first hymn, prone to stray, God then says to us, through the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection, that your sins are forgiven you. It's like he helps us back up on our feet and brushes us off and says, try again, try again, try again. He never gives up lifting us up. His arm is always there to help us. And then everlasting life is a promise to us. It's a promise to all of us here. I don't know what that looks like. I can only wonder. But I believe there is life beyond this life. And if God is love as I believe him to believe, then I believe that this life to come is one that is filled with love. And whatever that is, it's good. It is good. Are there any more monuments that can bear witness? I would say there's one more. And it's as important as the first two. And that is you are monuments. Each one of you. In your own way. In your own way of understanding God and living out God's word. We're all different, so we'll all understand it a bit differently. We'll all live it out a bit differently. But together as a group, as well as individuals, we are witnessing all the time to what 
guides us inside, what our bearings are, what our compass is. We're witnessing to that consciously and certainly unconsciously. So when our children and your children and your grandchildren look up at you and say, what is faith? You go to church, mommy and daddy, or they may not say it like that, but it's implied. What is faith? Well, it's not so much now quoting them scripture. Well, the Bible says, the Bible says, they'll get that along in Sunday school and elsewhere. <clears throat> I would suggest to you that the most important thing you can say to them is your experience of God. That monument for the Israelites crossing the Jordan River was an experience of God intervening in their lives, in their journey into the promised land. It was an experience that they could understand. It's an experience that they could share. It was an experience of an active living God, not words out of a book, as much as an experience of those words. So we share with others how God has touched our lives. Where God has touched our lives. When God has led us, an actual experience. An actual experience of just feeling loved by God. An actual experience of being nurtured by God, that inner voice that says, that's a good way to go, or mm, not so much. The God that touches our lives, that's something to share with children. How you raise the children, how you treat other human beings is certainly seen by children and very much influenced, influencing them. Our behavior is a reflection of our walk with God. That's a witness. So when you're, t when you're about to discipline a child, Think first, rather than acting, what's the best expression of my faith of this God to this child? Now, if you're anything like me, uh, when I disciplined our children, I engaged my feelings rather than my thinking. I'd like to think sometimes. But not so. I don't think so. But then it's what we do afterwards. Where we can sit down with them. And the black cloud has moved along. And we can talk about the whole experience. And if I've been overreactive. And I recognize it. I can say that to them and apologize for my overreaction. And then they get the full gist of there's some things you don't do because there's repercussions. But that in those who are enforcing the rules of the house, there's also compassion. And that they're not perfect either. So how we interact with our children our grandchildren, and with each other is a direct reflection, revelation of the intimacy that we have with God and how God is shaping and reshaping who we are. Guilt can be a wonderful thing if it leads us to change. It's an absolutely horrible thing if we don't let 
go of it when we have changed. It's very destructive, shaming and guilt. Very destructive. Where people spend a lot of time in therapy working through their shame and how it's impacted their personality or their guilt and how that's influenced their way of thinking and being about who they are. Their self-image is quite crushed by shame and guilt. It's not helpful when it's carried for any length of time. But it can be helpful to help us become aware of something that needs to change. But then as we get older, we can see that some of this shame and guilt that have been placed onto us by other people was really misplaced. It was really misplaced. And we learn then to not do that to others. It was said earlier about uh, the pressures of life. Well, the pressures of life, uh, how do they go? Tim, the, uh, the pressure of life makes diamonds. It's pressure that made the, di thank you, Tim. It's pressure that made the diamond. Without the pressure, be no diamond. Well, in God's eyes, the good news is he sees us all as diamonds. Yay. And the good news also is he's helping us to see ourselves that way too. And to be that monument as we go forward in life, as we are walking towards the promised land that is heaven for all of us, that we do not walk alone. There's a song to that effect. We do not walk alone. And it's in that that we find our hope, we find our, our peace. It's in that that we find our courage. In a short period of time, you are all going to be walking forward into the promised land on earth the new pastor and you can say together as Paul did I can do out of Philippians morning scripture I can do all things through him who strengthens me I can do all things through him who strengthens me as you journey on with a new pastor you both can do all things in him who will strengthen you. To be more of a monument in this community. To grow as a community, as a witness, as your individual lights shine more brightly and more honestly and corporately a beautiful beacon to all. You know, I wrote here somewhere something, here we go. Nope, that's not it. Nope, that's not it. Nope, that's not it. Nope, that's not it. We'll get to it. Uh, let's see. In one of my churches when I was in seminary, I wrote last page I wrote manuscripts like this real legitimate manuscripts you could bind them up and for posterity or burn them whatever <coughs> so I was so tied to the manuscript and it was down in J Jersey City and um, it was a very hot summer day very hot no fans no air conditioning and it was sweltering but they opened up the windows, and I had my notes all out here. And as I'm starting now, there's a wind that comes in. And my notes went all over the place. And I did not have them numbered. Yeah. So, and they're all down in front and all over. And uh, 
I had to journey forward without any notes. And that was a learning experience. Rather humiliating one, but a, a learning one. But I've got it here. And it's this. There's a warning. Well, first let me say that we find strength and hope as we recall the experiences of the past. Think about it. We find strength and hope as we recall the experiences of the past. And the warning is that people and congregation who never look to the past in gratitude may not find the confidence they need for the future. I encourage you to look at your past as a congregation. There are books here, your books, that go back to the 1920s and 30s and come forward. Read about your past. You have a future, a mighty future, and you can go forward with new past with confidence, determination, hope, inspiration. And you know what inspiration can do. It's beyond our imagination. When you catch the fire, you have it here. Believe in yourselves and embrace your new pastor. For we can do all things in him, Christ, God, who strengthens us. Amen. Let us pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you that we have the opportunity to partake in the communion of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. What a gift you have given us. But how painful it was for you to allow your son to endure what he needed to for our salvation. We thank you. May these gifts of bread and wine be to us a renewal of life, of hope, of courage, of love for each other, and a future together. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We come in remembrance that our Lord Jesus Christ was sent of the Father into the world to assume our flesh and blood and to fulfill for us all obedience to the divine law, even to the bitter and shameful death of the cross. By his death, resurrection, and ascension, he established a new and eternal covenant of grace and reconciliation that we might be accepted of God and never be forsaken by him. Secondly, we come to have communion, a sharing in with the same Christ who has promised to be with us always, even to the end of the world. In the breaking of the bread, he makes himself known to us as the true heavenly bread that strengthens us until life eternal. And in the cup of blessing, he comes to us as the vine in whom we must abide if we too are ever to bear fruit. We come in hope believing that this bread and this cup are a pledge and a foretaste of that feast of love of which we shall partake when his kingdom has fully come, when with unveiled eyes we shall behold him made like unto him. Now since by his death and resurrection and ascension he has obtained for us the life-giving spirit who unites us all in one body, so are we to receive this supper in true brotherly love mindful of the communion of saints, all those 
who have worshipped here who are no longer with us. And he could might, uh, easily say their spirits abound in this sanctuary. As Jesus Christ was in the upper room with his disciples just a few hours before he was to be led before the Sanhedrin and found guilty and then crucified on the cross. They sat there and he broke the bread and he gave it to them and he said, take and eat. Take and eat. This is the bread of life, the bread of renewal, the bread of hope. the bread that is forever. And after the same manner also, Jesus Christ, he took the cup of blessing and he said, this is the New Testament or covenant in my blood. Do this as often in remembrance of me. The new covenant is that our sins are forgiven us because of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please take your communion goblets and take off the top where the bread is. And take the piece of bread and take it the bread which we break is the sharing in of the life of Jesus Christ. Be like Jesus. Take this bread. Now, Father in heaven, enable us to grow in wisdom and in stature. May it be said that we see Jesus walking in that other person. May we be that Jesus, that you live, you breathe, you live within us. Amen. And take the top off of your juice. The cup of blessing which we bless is the communion, the sharing in of the blood of Jesus Christ. Take and drink all of it. The juice that we take is a washing of ourselves internally. We are made whiter than to know what a gift you have given us still, Lord. So undeserving as we are, but so loving you are. For this communion may it find its home in us and strengthening us to be a witness, a monument to this world of your grace, your mercy, of your love. Now, Father, we will pray together our communion prayer. We speak to you intimately. As one, we pray for the bread that we have eaten, for the wine that we have tasted, for the life that you have given. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise you. For the life of Christ within us, turning all our fears to freedom, help us to live for others Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise you. For the strength of Christ to lead us, for our living and our dying, in the end with all people, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise you. And now, Father, hear the Son that you hear the prayer that you've taught us all to pray whenever we speak to you intimately. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, dear friends, our last hymn together in Christ alone. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm to the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter. Howdy, friends, in the power of Christ, go forth as monuments to the witness of God's love, compassion, forgiveness to all humankind. Amen. Amen.